pleasure to be here. Wait, wait. No, I'll, do, I'll, do it the, I'll do it the French way. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's, um, it's been an extraordinary experience working on this uh, edition. Uh, I formed many virtual friendships, which have suddenly become real friendships. Uh, just, uh, and, it, and it's, um, it's been a privilege. Uh, and um, uh, it's, been, it's been great to, to work on these uh, texts. And, and actually, I'd like to thank in particular the editor, I, particular editor I worked with, uh, Jim Gibbons, who was um, wonderful. Uh, yeah, do, do, <laughs> do clap. Uh, um, so, uh, just to, uh, Max has described the, the works very, very well, I think. Um, I thought perhaps I might start by saying something about this being a volume in the Library of America um, and the, the Americanness or the question of Americanness in uh, James' family books. Uh, his, he never really called them autobiographies, although he occasionally confesses that they are quite autobiographical. Um, but uh, he, he was long anglicized and Londonized and cocknified, um, although he wasn't yet naturalized uh, at the time when he wrote them. Uh, and he'd been in exile uh, for a long time. But one of the things I think he's doing in these books is reasserting his Americanness. Um, and that in a way he'd been reasserting his Americanness also in uh, the, the great novels of the major phase, uh, the am Ambassadors and the Dove and the Golden Bowl, where he returns to having American protagonists um, after writing about English life and English uh, figures for uh, a decade or more. Um, so this is an interesting return going on in those. And, and of course, he'd also, uh, about 10 years before, uh, returned to America for the first time for 21 years, uh, traveled around and written an amazing, amazing uh, sort of travel book or a meditation, The American Scene, um, which is a very, very rich uh, work. Um, uh, Perhaps another thing to say is that uh, Small Boy and Others and Notes of Son and Brother embody some very suggestive principles uh, or theories of autobiography. Um, that, that, and in a way, they're a kind of experiment. Um, uh, for James, the events he recall in the past uh, become real in the act of remembering them. Uh, and he's, in a way, remembering the past and he's at the same time watching himself remember and being struck by the vividness of these memories as they come flooding back. Uh, and so, so in a way, you're always watching James remembering and or watching this, often the small boy, um, uh, as, as we'll see. Um, uh, so I think it's, it's fascinating. And, and it made me think of Freud, actually, and Freud's interpretation of dreams and the way that the Freud dreams become dream texts. And that for James, the words that he's remembering uh, are often important, <coughs> and, and you know, for Freud, it's the it's uh, it's the words and their associations. And for James too, the, he remembers one word, and then it brings this flood of other words and other names, uh, so that he goes to the theatre and uh, you know, he remembers the name of one actor, and then he remembers all the other plays they were in, and then he remembers the person that, you know the person they were playing opposite. So it's, it's just overwhelming uh, for him. It's, it's a um, I think it's a new thing in his career. There's nothing nowhere else. Uh, it's quite like that. Um, uh, right, I might just read you some little bits from James's letters uh, where he's uh, conceiving um, the, uh, these volumes. Uh, he was asked by his nephew Harry Henry James the uh, Third how he got the idea to do the uh, autobiographies, uh, and he says that it was in talk with uh, William James's widow. Alice in uh, Cambridge in, in 1910, as, as Max just said. Um, uh, he, was, he was talking to her about, about their, the past. He said, that turn of talk was the germ. It dropped the seed. Once when I'd been reminiscing over some matters of your, your dad's and my old life of the time previous, far previous to her knowing us, over some memories of our father and mother and the rest of us, I had moved her to exclaim with the most generous appreciation and response, oh, Henry, why don't you write these things? with such an effect that after a bit I found myself wondering vaguely whether I mightn't do something of the sort um, uh, and of course he does do something of the sort 
it's it's actually sort of interesting. In the, at the end of his life, he's in a way turning from fiction to uh, non-fiction to to reminiscence in various ways. Um, he wrote a, uh, a memoir of William Wetmore's story, the American sculptor he'd known in Rome in the 1870s. He was more or less forced at gunpoint to write that by the family uh, <laughs> and complained a lot about the, um, the paucity of the materials. But he, he, in a way, got the idea for the... That's, it's sort of the model for Notes of a Son and Brother, where the material is so much richer and more uh, rewarding. Uh, and in the American scene, he's also returning a lot to the places he'd known in his youth in America and revisiting old sites and revisiting old friends uh, and comparing the past and the present. Uh, and, and so, um, uh, in a way, that, that process of memory culminates in these, in these volumes. Um, uh, and the way he wrote them uh, was typically tentative and exploratory and organic, so that he thought of it as, good, as a single book, and then it became two books. Um, and then he started doing a third book, which, alas, he didn't get any further with um, than uh, the, the chapters we have. Uh, the middle years. Um, he told his agent, what I really make out is that I seem to have sufficient material quite for two books, two distinct ones, taking the place of the one multifarious and comprehensive one that I originally <coughs> saw. Um, uh, and so that's why we have Small Boy and others with no letters by William and then Notes of a Southern Brother, which is, uh, uh, has, has many more document, original documents in. Um, uh, and he had to justify this to his nephew, Harry, who was uh, going to edit w William's letters after uh, he'd finished with them. And uh, so when he was going to do two books instead of one, Harry was, I think, rather aghast. Um, and so J James writes these long letters justifying uh, what he's done. Uh, he tells him, this whole record of early childhood simply grew so, as one came to write it, that one could but let it take its way. And it was a miracle to me, and still is as I go on further, how the memories revived and pressed upon me, and how they keep a doing of it in the letters book. This earlier thing makes a book in itself, and I think a very charming and original and unprecedented one of its kind, which has the merit of giving a whole introductory or, or initiatory family picture as an approach to the later stage. Um, uh, if he'd only lived longer, how much, goodness knows how many of these uh, books of memoirs we would have had. Um, uh, I thought maybe the education of Henry Adams uh, by his friend Adams, which uh, Adams had sent him in, uh, I think, 1909, um, worth bringing in, because I think he, his responses to it are suggestive. Uh, Adams, in the education, says, no one has discussed what part of education has in his personal experience turned out to be useful and what not. This volume attempts to discuss it. Um, <laughs> And uh, um, Adams is a bit more utilitarian than James in his idea of what is useful in later life. Uh, James is much more generous uh, in, in his allowance of that. He reacted very strongly to Adams's book. Uh, in August 1909, he wrote uh, to Adams saying that the reason he hadn't acknowledged the book was because he was so responsive to it um, on account of the... <laughs> Typically Jamesian excuse, but, uh, <laughs> but probably true as well. Uh, because he says, the crushing, it was the crushing consciousness of far too much to say. I lost myself in your ample page, as in a sea of memories and visions and associations. I dived deep, and I think felt your ex extraordinary element, every inch of its suggestion and recall and terrible thick evocation. So much that I've remained below, as it were, sticking fast in it, even as an indiscreet fly in amber. <laughs> um, and in some ways that comes quite close to what James himself ends up doing. Uh, that the, uh, it's, it's such an enveloping medium that he produces. Um, uh, James engages in a way with the same topic, uh, though maybe for James uh, the idea of education isn't quite so much it. I, I sometimes think that these uh, volumes are like Wordsworth's prelude, that they're an account of the growth of a poet's mind. And James often in his late years does refer to himself as a, as a poet. Um, anyway, I think we could see the following passage in, uh, in Small Boy and Others as James's response to Adams. Because uh, here the idea of waste, which bothers Adams so much, 
um, uh, James finds that nothing is really wasted. Everything flows into, uh, he everything uh, becomes a, a, a stimulus or a profit. Um, this is when the, the small boy James is a flaneur, a young flaneur in New York. Uh, I think this is the house which had um, uh, a sort of funny little farmyard at the corner of Fifth Avenue and 18th Street, uh, where he used to stand and peer in through the railings. I, at any rate, he says, watch the small boy dawdle and gape again. I smell the cold, dusty paint and iron as the rails of the 18th Street corner rub his contemplative nose and, feeling him foredoomed, withhold from him no grain of my sympathy. He is a convenient little image or warning of all that was to be for him, and he might well have been even happier than he was, for there was the very pattern and measure of all he was to demand, just to be somewhere, almost anywhere would do, and somehow receive an impression or an accession, feel a relation or a vibration. He was to go without many things, ever so many, as all persons do, in whom contemplation takes so much the place of action. But everywhere in the years that came soon after, and that in fact continued long, in the streets of great towns, in New York still for some time, and then for a while in London, in Paris, in Geneva, wherever it might be, he was to enjoy more than anything was so far from showy practice, <coughs> wandering and dawdling and gaping. He was really, I think, much to profit by it. What it at all appreciably gave him, that is, gave him in producible form, would be difficult to state. But it seems to him, as he even now thus indulges himself, <coughs> an education like another. That's just the Adam's word. Um, feeling, as he has come to do more and more, that no education avails for the intelligence that doesn't stir in it some subjective passion. And that, on the other hand, almost anything that does so act <coughs> is largely ed educative, however small a figure the process might make in a scheme of training. So I think that, that, that seems to me to be him, him responding to Adams uh, and really finding that all sorts of subtle things that are almost that are difficult to talk about um, go into the formation of somebody's imagination, somebody's character. Um, uh, um, I thought I'd just read you some more passages because it's <laughs> such a pleasure. Um, in A Small Boy and Others, um, uh, thinking about the formative, uh, he's always tracing things back to formative experiences. Um, uh, he reflects very interestingly about uh, a hostess from his childhood and uh, the power of just her manner, the way she behaved and was, uh, and how it, it was exemplary uh, for him in, in its effect. Um, and he says, one's record becomes under memories of this order, and that is the only trouble, a tale of assimilation small and fine, out of which refuse directly interesting to the subject victim only, the most branching vegetations may be conceived as having sprung. Such are the absurdities of the poor dear inward life, when translated that is, and perhaps ineffectually translated, into terms of the outward, and trying at all to flourish on the lines of the outward, a reflection that might stay me here, weren't it that I somehow feel morally affiliated, tied as by knotted fibres to the elements involved. Uh, and I think in a way he's saying there what's so difficult about what he's doing. He's taking these very subtle and fine impressions that he remembers and trying to show how important they were for him, uh, even when that, that's a, a difficult process. And, and probably some of the obscure passages I think one should confess there are some difficult passages <laughs> in these books, uh, are moments when he's trying to state things that are very difficult to state. And that's what's so great about James everywhere, really, that he's able to render you know, the effects of secrets on a group of people or uh, th those sort of things that somehow nobody else seems to be able to write about in, in the same way. Um, uh, so uh, that, that organic image of um, uh, refuse and, and uh, roots and so on, is, um, everything is, is organic in, uh, in these works, I think. Um, uh, and James discovers his meaning in the process of uh, speaking or writing. And it's very important that, I mean, it's particularly good to have Theodore Bosenkay's Henry James at work, uh, you know, his amanuensis memoir. I mean, she's partly a wonderful, vivid writer about him, very affectionate and uh, very astute uh, as well, um, because these are such spoken works that they, they think very often he dictated without too many notes. Uh, he just, um, you know, it all 
he says, uh, the dictating, it all feels, it seems to be pulled out of me as I, as I speak. Um, uh, so it's, it's coming from somewhere, and even James isn't quite sure where it is. It's, it's often surprising to him. Um, uh, so I'd just like to um, uh, pull out a, a sentence that I particularly uh, enjoy, which is, um, it's prompted by uh, James recollecting the daguerreotype that's the frontispiece for Small Boy and Others, which is reproduced in, uh, in the Library of America edition. Uh, the daguerreotype by Matthew Brady, uh, who was later the great photographer of the Civil War, um, which uh, James and his father had taken, I think, a bit on impulse uh, when they were staying in Staten Island for the summer and they came over to the city. Um, uh, and I, I think it's on, Im on impulse because James is wearing this jacket that he's rather embarrassed by, uh, which Thackeray um, comments on the size of his buttons uh, <laughs> and says that in England he would be called buttons if he wore a jacket like that <laughs> and he's never able to live it down. Um, uh, and and this, this is about, it leads up to his great eulogy of, uh, about peaches and how peaches were everywhere in his, uh, in his youth. Um, uh, and he talks about uh, coming to the queer, empty, dusty, smelly New York of midsummer. I apply that last term because we'll, we always arrive by boat, and I have still in my nostril the sense of the abor, the outskirts of the hot town, the rank and rubbishy waterside quarters where big, loose cobbles for the least of all the base items lay wrenched from their sockets of pungent black mud, and where the dependent streets, managed by law of their own, to be all corners, and the corners to be all groceries. Grocery is indeed, lar indeed largely of the green order, so far as greenness could persist in the torrid air, <laughs> and that bristled in glorious defiance of traffic with the overflow of their wares and implements. Uh, it's kind of wonderful, uh, packed sentence, everything is. Uh, these streets that are all corners and corners that are all groceries. <laughs> wonderful, uh, hyperbolic uh, description. Um, uh, and then... Uh, another passage, a uh, famous episode um, that he represents as a kind of revelation and, and really a revelation for himself as a, as a novelist and as a, as a would-be dramatist. Uh, obviously James is, well James's drama hasn't yet been uh, published by the Library of America. I, I'm rather a fan of his drama. Um, I'm, I think I might be almost alone in the world. <laughs> um, uh, um, in the summer of 1854, anyway, the 11-year-old the James is staying with cousins in their house at uh, Rhinebeck overlooking the Hudson, and the evening is drawing in. Uh, one of the family members is uh, seriously ill within doors, and uh, Marie, James's female cousin, uh, who's thought to be rather spoiled, is told to go to bed and uh, is reluctant to go. It's not a grand incident. In fact, it's barely an incident at all by most people's standards, but James draws quite a moral from it. It had been remarked, but in the air, I feel sure, that Marie should seek her couch, the truth by the dark wing of which I ruefully felt myself brushed. So it means that he feels he should, that they're implying that he ought to go to bed as well. Um, and the words seem therefore to fall with a certain ironic weight. What I've retained of their effect, at any rate, is the vague fact of some objection raised by my cousin, and some sharper point to his sentence supplied by her father, promptly merged in a visible commotion, a flutter of my young companion across the gallery, as for refuge in the maternal arms, a protest and an appeal, in short, which drew from my aunt a simple phrase that was from that moment so preposterously to count for me. Come now, my dear, don't make a scene. I insist on your not making a scene. <laughs> that, was all the, that was all the witchcraft the occasion used, but the note was nonetheless epoch-making. The expression so vivid, so portentous, was one I had never heard. It had never been addressed to us at home. And who should say now what a world one, wouldn't, one mightn't at once read into it? It seemed freighted to sail so far. It told me so much about life. Life at these intensities clearly became scenes. But the great thing, the immense illumination, was that we could make them or not as we chose. It didn't in the least matter, accordingly, whether or not a scene was then proceeded to. And I had lost all count of what immediately happened. The mark had been made for me and the door flung open. The passage, gathering up all the elements of the troubled time, had been itself a scene, quite enough of one, and I had become aware with it of a rich accession of possibilities. Um, so it's another piece of education, in a way. It tells, tells him something about life. 
Uh, but it's also wonderful how this, uh, he doesn't even remember whether there was a scene. She was told not to make a scene, maybe she didn't make a scene, she just went quietly to bed. It doesn't matter because the scene for James is this, is this uh, it's in, a way, in a sense, it's the importance of it for James. So it's as in his fiction, it's, it's the way it's registered by somebody uh, that, that really matters. Um, uh, so it's a simple phrase, but it's not so simple uh, as, as it seems. This idea of making a scene in a way it's uh, it's also kind of finding a shape and a form uh, so it's like it's like drama um, uh, and James is often thinking about ways in which life can be shaped like art uh, and the contrast and similarity between between life and art um, so, so it's, it's I think a great scene so I, I'll just end with one last quotation which is the final bit of um, a small boy and others um, it ends with James in Boulogne uh, at the age of 12. Um, uh, and uh, I associate Small Boy and others, and particularly the end, with what Maisie knew, which also ends in Boulogne. Uh, I like to think that Maisie is 12. I'd like to think I've seen a letter somewhere where James says that, but I honestly can't, can't remember where it would be. Um, uh, but at the end of um, uh, Small Boy and others, He's in Boulogne, and he's simultaneously uh, awakened to the fullness of European experience, and he's coming down with typhus fever. Uh, so this strange uh, double um, uh, double impact, I suppose. Um, he's awakened uh, both by the combination of French types and provincial settings, which prepare him for reading Balzac later in life, mm -hmm. and also Boulogne is full of rather down-at-heel English aristocrats who are there because it's cheaper than living in England. <laughs> And there's an English library in Boulogne where he's reading the novels of Thackeray about just these kinds of people. Uh, so it's a kind of a very uh, vivid place for him. Um, uh, and this, uh, and ex rather extraordinarily, the book ends with James swooning, uh, um, but then with a little comic twist right at the, the very end. Um, so I, th I think it's a, uh, a great piece, and, and I'll, I'll just finish with this. Present to me still is the fact of my sharper sense after an hour or two of my being there in distress and, as happened for the moment, alone. Present to me are the sounds of the soft afternoon, the mild animation of the Boulogne street through the half-open windows. Present to me, above all, the strange sense that something had begun that would make more difference to me in directly and indirectly than anything had yet, sorry, anything had ever yet made. I might verily on the spot have seen, as in a fading of day and a change to something suddenly queer, the whole large extent of it. I must thus, much impressed but half scared, have wanted to appeal, to which end I tumbled all too weakly out of bed and wavered toward the bell just across the room. The question of re whether I really reached and ran rang it was to remain lost afterwards in the strong, sick whirl of everything about me, under which I fell into a <coughs> lapse of consciousness that I shall conveniently here treat as a considerable gap. <laughs> and so that's the end of the small boy and others, and then there's a gap, and then you get the notes of a southern brother. So he swoons into, and then says, the end of volume one. <laughs> um, so I think it's a, an amazing little passage. And, uh, th th thank you very much. So I, I'd be uh, happy to take any questions. That was a wonderful talk, and I thought I might ask you to comment on James's use of evidence. And what I have in mind is a story I'm sure you know quite well. Um, after William James's widow read um, Small Boy and others, uh, she came into possession of a cache of letters written by Minnie Temple to John Chipman Gray, and she thought they would do nicely for the mm. expected second volume, and as you know, mm. toward the end of that volume, indeed, there are a lot of quotations on those letters. But she and her daughter, before sending them to James, uh, copied them. And so we actually have the copies they transcribed, but not the originals, because of course James destroyed the originals. But it was his use of the originals that I thought I would invite your comments on. Uh, your sense of how let us say, um, appropriate 
use of the material? Uh, yes. Well, he did revise her letters <laughs> for <laughs> use in the uh, volume, and uh, <coughs> it's the kind of editorial practice we wouldn't smile on <laughs> nowadays. <laughs> um, uh, he, I suppose couldn't help himself. Uh, I mean, he revised, uh, well, he revised his own works whenever he reread them. And he also uh, says um, in his letters to other writers, his friends, I rewrite you much as I read. <laughs> so rewriting was the way he read, I suppose. Um, uh, and it was an act of affection, I suppose, for him. Uh, very often, I think he's, he feels with William's letters, I know that he's protecting William in some way, that he's putting William before the public and these are private letters and that uh, he wants him to be well-dressed. Um, so I suppose I'm slightly queasy about it, but on the whole, uh, on the whole indulgent. Um, I mean, he w I think he probably wouldn't have been able to bring himself to use Minnie Temple's letters raw, as it were. Um, uh, but um, so we, And we wouldn't have an amazing chapter if he hadn't done it that way. But, I mean, you're right to bring it up. Um, uh, and, and it's a very good thing that we have the original letters. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, you began by speaking a little bit about James's later reflections on his, on America or his Americanism uh, or his American connections. Or, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. Yes. Uh, well, as as Max mentioned, I'm, I've got a long, I've got too many long-running projects. One of them is uh, it's a book on James and Theodore Roosevelt, and Roosevelt yes. had been. <laughs> rather denouncing James quite a lot in, in some speeches and it, certainly in his letters uh, for, for being in exile and for being insuffici insufficiently American. Un-American un is actually the word that's used. Um, and there are speeches in which he says that, uh, uh, I think it was a speech in the 1890s to some club in New York where he says that there are lots of great Irish immigrants coming in and they're thoroughly American and there are great... German immigrants coming in and they can't quite speak English very well yet, but they're patriotically American. Why can't we trade some of those for Henry James? He actually names James and says, let's, let's get rid of him. He says, uh, so, and, J and James became aware of that. I think he was sort of aware of it, but he be certainly became aware of it in 1898 when he reviews Roosevelt's essays. And there's a sort of picture of him as the uh, feet undersized man of letters. Um, and so I I think that's one of the reasons for his feeling that he needs to come back and reassert his roots. Uh, and I, I suppose also assert a version of Americanness which is more various and informal and, uh, and generous than Roosevelt's. You know, gen Roosevelt's is based quite a lot on exclusion. Um, whereas for James, uh, what, what Americanness is, is, is uh, created by all the people who are American and all the things that they do. And that the more things they do, then the richer America is. Um, and, and so, uh, I mean, in the chapters about Harvard in the autobiographies, he talks about how he's excited to be among all these American young men because obviously the James family had been either taught in you know, by governesses or in foreign schools a lot of the time. Um, and, and he says he's searching for Americanism. Uh, he actually uses the word Americanism there, which I think is, is also slightly related to, to Roosevelt. So he, he's conscious of the way in which he was, he's quite a controversial figure in, you know, from the 1880s onwards, since, you know, from, certainly from Daisy Miller onwards. People were asking how American he really was and, and so on. Um, he was he was quite tough about it, I think. Uh, you know, he said he didn't read the newspapers and, and so on. But but people were, I mean, he was a very divisive figure in that sense. As in a way, he still is. There's still you know, <coughs> some of the reviews, you know, uh, that that James gets now. Uh, some people love him, and some people can't quite manage. Uh, <laughs>
Yes. Yeah, I'd love to, I haven't actually read the play, but I'd love to hear your defense of it, or at least what you appreciate about it. Uh, well, I suppose the, um, I have a, I think there are lots of Henry James reading groups around the place, and I have a Henry James reading group in London. Uh, we started with the Golden Bowl, but at the end of every term, uh, we read a play. And we started with Guy Dronville because that's the one that you know, is, is, is famous. And um, uh, I mean, I think that wasn't the only one. No, no, no. Th th there's, a, there's a volume that thick. Um, uh, some, some of them published in his lifetime and some not. Um, the ones I really like are the comedies because uh -huh. they're just very funny. Oh, um, and there was a, uh, an early James editor called Alan Wade who edited James's essays on the drama uh, as a scenic art and he also produced certainly at least one of James's plays and I think there's a letter quoted in, in the volume of the collected plays which says that if you get the right actors who understand what they're doing and you pitch it the right way it's a sort of sublimely pleasurable experience it's a very refined form so it's, it's I suppose like you know, French theatre Maribel or you know, Moliere or something that, that uh, you just have to get the right note but obviously the moment that goes wrong it's not such a pleasure <laughs> and in Guy Donville you know the, there were all sorts of things going wrong James was made to cut the text to the bone um, uh, I think the reason it was heckled possibly was because uh, the actor manager had enemies who sent people in to heckle, uh, so that it wasn't actually a genuine audience reaction. It was a, it was a plot, as it, as it were. Uh, and when they started heckling, then then uh, one of the actresses who had a, a rather, because it's an 18th century play, she had some huge wig, and she became terribly self-conscious and sort of uh, stumbled over her lines and so on. So it, 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 it wasn't a fair test. Yeah. I suppose that's, that's Did he understand that? Because it was so traumatic, it seems to have almost changed his way of writing uh, I, th I think he it, it was traumatic but um, no. he said a year before that that he gave he was going to have another year of writing plays and after that he'd return to the fiction and so I think it only had to be not a great success yeah. so I don't you know it ran for I think 30 or 40 performances I can't remember so it, you know I mean now that's not really a flop at all um, I, I, think, you know, I mean, you know, it's not a it's not a huge hit, but but it, it didn't close overnight or anything. Um, so, uh, that and uh, I mean, you know, I mean, the um, he's he's a great writer of dialogue, and um, you know, in the, in the novels, the difficult scenes in the novels, you um, uh, if you read them out loud suddenly you hear what's going on. I mean, you just have to hear it sometimes. Well, there's one theory that he sort of forswore dialogue after that, that he wanted to get away from anything yeah. kind of descriptive or, or with dialogue. He, I mean, yeah. in an almost revengeful, vengeful way. Uh, Opaqueness. He well, he, he sort of, uh, he has chapters which are almost all dialogue and then chapters which yeah. have no dialogue. So, um, uh, I don't know. No, I, th I think he, he, was, he was pretty good at it, yeah. I think. But, I mean, maybe they all do speak a bit like Henry James. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, um, but he's very good on upper-class slang as well uh, in, in England. You know, um, uh, very funny. Um, and in the Golden Bowl, the conversation between um, the Assingham's, uh, you when know, they're trying to work out what's going on, it's very, very <laughs> amusing, I think. Yes. Can you speak a bit about James and his father in the middle of my mind? Yes. Um, he's very protective of his father, I think. Um, uh, I was remembering there's a passage where he talks about his father's uh, wooden leg uh, meant that he couldn't walk. Uh, you know, well, he couldn't walk in the way in which the young, Je the young Jameses you know, walked for hours and hours in the city. Um, uh, and I think it's why they spent so much time in the city rather than in the country, because the roads weren't uh, good enough. Uh, and he talks about, I think, an icy street in Boston and his father's difficulty in sort of managing on the slopes uh, and so on. So I think, I think they all must have rather defended the father and 
they also felt, I think, slightly exposed by the father. Of, um, you know, I mean, I, th I think at school they're asked what church they go to, the James boys, and they ask the father what they should say. <laughs> and he says, say that all the churches are yours. So, you know, the, the world is your oyster. And so there's a very unsatisfactory response. <laughs> they just need to be able to say you know, which church they go to so that people know wh where to put them. Um, uh, but, th I mean, the father is... Um, well, uh, was it the Sw Secret of Swedenborg was one of his works and uh, I got, was it W. D. Howells or some, uh, somebody who said um, uh, that, that he kept it in that book <laughs> you, you can read the book and you still don't know what the Secret of Swedenborg is um, uh, so in a way he was a terribly obscure writer and uh, in a sense I suppose you could see that as <coughs> in some people's view uh, you know picked up by uh, Henry James Jr. Um, uh, but also he, um, I suppose the thing that, uh, maybe the moral inheritance for James was that um, Henry James Sr. was very passionately against prigs, uh, you know, self-righteous uh, people and moralism. Um, and uh, so you can see it in what Maisie knew or something, the way that Maisie's, Mrs. Wicks is always saying to Maisie, what's happened to your moral sense? And in a way, Maisie doesn't want to have a moral sense, mm. but there's something moral going on underneath. Mm. And it's just that what's moral is richer and more, I mean, it's more Jamesian, really. Uh, it's more subtle and it's to do with appreciating the situation and feeling the complexity of your relations with everybody and, and so on. And, and so it's not about making those black and white judgments. That, um, and, and I think that's something that does come from Henry James Sr. Um, yes. Does um, do your autobiographical works have any um, bearing on the issue of James's, um, or the topic of James's sexuality? Uh, well, they uh, have been taken to have bearing on it. Uh, I'm slightly agnostic on the question. Uh, well, I suppose I think that there isn't quite enough evidence to be sure, and that since James is so ambiguous about most things, most of the evidence is ambiguous too. Um, I perhaps should say that there is another edition of James's autobiographies which has very long interpretive footnotes explaining why certain scenes show how gay James is. Uh, and I'm slightly, that's not my kind of editing, really. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I'd like to keep an open mind, I think. Um, James certainly felt late in life that he regretted things I suppose, uh, when I think of all those passages I read out, that um, uh, he talks about all the things you miss if you uh, follow the imaginative life to the full. Um, and he felt those sacrifices in sort of his loneliness late in life. But what exactly the alternative to the loneliness would have been, he doesn't say. Um, uh, Edmund Goss, um, I've just I've just written a piece for the TLS about James's illness and death and funeral. Uh, Edmund Goss says that James used to slip into Chelsea Old Church um, filled with unutterable regrets. And uh, you know, so he didn't go to church services necessarily, <laughs> but he went to church. To, and, and there are lots of scenes in James' fiction where people go into churches you know, informally, privately, to meditate or reflect on things. So um, we don't know quite what that was. Um, uh, but I mean, I suppose everybody should read the autobiographies and see what they think. Yes. Paul Lafarge? Sorry? Paul Lafarge? John Lafarge. John Lafarge. Yes. John yeah. Lafarge. So what about him? Well, I mean, the relationship between James and Lafarge. Um, in, in terms of James's sexuality, or in terms yeah, of... Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I have a collection of letters that's been embargoed by the Lafarge family oh. from being revealed 
So we've never opened them, and I'm just curious, because he speaks very movingly about Lafarge yes. in the middle memoir. Oh, that's right. Well, I think that is to do with Lafarge's... Uh, no, I'm slightly hazy about what it was, but was it his... I think a mental breakdown or no, a financial no, crisis no, or something. There was something, this wasn't is, there? This is when he builds Tudor. He's, he's uh, uh, they're in Providence. They're studying art. Oh, when they're studying art. Yeah. Uh, I think he's quite appreciative about Lafarge's work at that when he's talking about that point, isn't he? And he talked. Uh, he certainly talked. I mean, for, for him, Lafarge was a great reader of. Uh, sort so of modern literature of Browning yeah, and right. French so, literature. So and they so on. bond over French literature. Yes. Uh, and Lafarge represented Europe and European culture to them, right. really, because so he, he was seems to idealize yes. Lafarge. Yes, yes. And uh, I mean, Lafarge was certainly one of the important figures in his early life, um, along with Thomas Sargent Perry, you know, who was another great reader, <coughs> slightly, slightly younger than James, but who was you know, reading Turgenev and uh, French literature. Uh, I mean, it was a very striking little set of people uh, there, I think. Just one last question on the American issue. In your own work, is there uh, a reading or a sense of encountering T.S. Eliot's feelings about James, given the similarity on some levels of their, of their histories? Um, well, I mean, James, I don't think, was ever aware of Eliot. No, but, but, but Eliot was certainly <laughs> very aware of James. And, um, well, he could, he could just have been. Uh, but, you know, he happened not to be, I think. Um, but, you know, the, the early poems of Eliot, he seems to be thinking of himself as being a poet who was writing poems that were like James's short stories. So... Yeah. Portrait of a Lady, obviously, is a Jamesian title, mm -hmm. and it's a very Jamesian situation. It's, it's like a late James story, uh, really. Um, and, well, when Christopher Ricks was doing the, uh, his edition of the early poems, in mentions of the March Hare, um, he, he sent me a few of the poems, asking if I could find Jamesian echoes. And there certainly th there were echoes of the Bostonians, I think, in, in some of them. Uh, I can't remember what else. But, but, so he was... And, and I think there's a, an epigraph, in, I, I won't say, I won't try and remember which poem, uh, which comes from uh, the Aspen Papers, uh, and so on. So, I mean, he, he does have, James is there, uh, as he was for Ezra Pound as well, I think. Um, uh, I mean, obviously for those two, he was a sort of model. Um, the point about Pound. Okay. Oh, thank you very much.